Chapter 25, all about how plants get nutrients and water. Neat slide to start out with, actually a pretty sad one. Shows about how um, land management, if not taken care of correctly, um, can really lead to land that can't grow anything versus reasonably uh, decent land for growing things. This is actually the island of Hispaniola, so on this side is Haiti, and on this side is the Dominican Republic. And um, as the book describes, um, and many of you know, maybe even from traveling there, that um, because of the way the governments have been run and basically the societies have grown in these two countries, um, Haiti has not taken care of their natural resources, planted crops that um, really used up the nutrients in the soil and didn't manage it correctly. Now they have a lot of erosion and they have a lot of problems growing things, whereas the Dominican Republic has done a little better job of managing it. Um, just goes to show you what you need to do to maintain good soil for plants. So where do plants get their nutrition from? Um, so they definitely get their CO2 from the air, um, and that gets fixed into cellulose and the sugars that the plant makes. Um, but the plants get not only water from their roots, but a lot of dissolved nutrients. So there are a lot of macronutrients, ions, that plants need to get. They need to get nitrogen through their roots, and we'll talk about the ways that they collaborate with some other organisms to get nitrogen. They need to get phosphates. Um, they need to get sulfur compounds. They need to get magnesium. Magnesium is coordinated in the chlorophyll molecule. Remember, it's in the middle of that porphyrin ring. So you need magnesium in a plant. Um, they need phosphorus. Um, and, and several other chlorine um, ma are macronutrients. Nutrients. They also need to have oxygen get to their roots, so that's why they're showing you this. Um, a lot of the experiments done to figure out what plants needed um, were done in the sort of hydroponic conditions where they would feed back um, different nutrients in the water solution. When a plant's missing some of its nutrients, you see it by uh, stunted growth and usually discoloration in the leaves. This would be the healthy plant, and these guys are not so much. Um, iron deficiencies show up as yellowing plants. We ha tend to have that in Southern California. We, some places have uh, iron-poor soil. And just by adding uh, supplements of iron, you can really get your plants to green up a lot. So how do the plants get that into their system? We know that the roots absorb the water, and we'll see how it gets into the plant in a minute. But an interesting thing, they actively help to get some of these cations into them. So they need calcium, potassium, and magnesium. And what the plants do is they um, effectively pump out hydrogen ions. They also release CO2, which goes through a carbonate um, intermediate, which helps to make um, carbonic acid and release the hydrogen ions. The hydrogen ions displace those um, cation nutrients that they need, magnesium, calcium, and potassium, by um, interfering with that interaction on clay, which is negatively charged. So basically the acidification of the soil helps to release these other ions that then can get um, taken up into the plant. Um, if we look closer at the root tips, we'll see um, that our roots um, in some organisms make collaborative relationships with other um, organisms. So here's a root sending out signals to a fungus, and this would be called mycorrhizae, and those signals attract the spores of the fungus to grow their hyphae or their branched um, units of their cells. Um, to grow into the root and deliver, and basically out here we're going to increase the surface area so the plant gets more water uptake. Another um, mutualistic relationship that some plants, not all, have, legumes are ones that do this, um, those were your peanuts and such, their root hairs um, send out signals that attract a um, bacteria called rhizobium, rhizobium and then rhizobium makes a colony and makes a nodule where these um, bacteria cells will fix nitrogen for the plant and deliver it right in there. Plants can't absorb free N2, whereas bacteria can. If plants can't make these associations, symbiotic associations with bacteria, what they do is that there are bacteria in the soil out here called um, nitrifying bacteria that will turn um, N2 into nitrate, NO3 minus 1, which then the plant can absorb. Um, 
this is a reaction that happens nitrogenase, which is the um, enzyme that actually fixes N2. So the enzyme binds to N2. Um, there's a reduction, or series of reduction reactions, and ultimately it releases ammonia, which the plants can also absorb. That's another way of um, the plants getting nitrogen. Some plants resort to um, very um, intricate means of getting more nitrogen. They eat other organisms. So this is a Venus flytrap. If I have enough time at the end of this, I'll show you a little video, and for sure I'll show it in class, of plants um, being touch sensitive and catching um, prey, literally, which they digest. And they do this to get more nitrogen. You can also help plants um, get more nitrogen by um, growing different kinds of plants together, some that encourage more growth of uh, the nitrifying bacteria in the soil, and along with another one to ensure that they get more nitrogen. Just because that's a cool picture, I had to show you again. Um, so what happens if a plant doesn't have enough water? The book has a little bit of a discussion that I want you to not worry about, um, the calculations for water potential. We did that way back when. You might remember pressure potential and water potential. We had to do that psi, look like a trident um, calculation. You want to go look that over that before the AP exam. We'll talk about it again. But this case, the plant has a water potential um, is zero because the solute potential is balanced by a pressure potential. Um, pressure potential and solute potential when they're equal to zero, the plant is very happy. Um, there's no pressure potential in this guy um, because they have a negative solute potential. Um, so he's limp. Bottom line is plants need to always have water going into them to stay upright. Don't worry about the calculations. How do the plants get that water into them? They get the water into the roots by two paths initially. So here's our root pair, root hair, and here are two paths. This is the symplast path where the water goes into the root hair and gets transported between cells. See how there's these little passageways between the cells? They're going through special gates almost between the cells into this area here, which I'll handle in a second. The second way is called the apoplastic route, and in this case, the water gets drawn between the cell walls. See, it never quite goes through the cell, it goes through the cell walls. In both paths, the water then hits a line called the Casparian strip. Basically, you could think about it as a, um, a seal that the, pl the plant has to maintain the correct amount of water going in and not lose it the other direction. Um, and that means that the water has to then carefully get transported through a cell, through the Casparian strip, to get into the xylem and the phloem, which is collectively called the steel of the plant. So what happens when the water gets into the xylem? We know that it moves up, even though gravity would want it to come down, because of a mechanism called transpiration. Remember way back when we talked about the polarity of the water molecule. Here it is over here. Hydrogens are partially positive, attracted to the partially negative oxygen. They make this lattice work to each other. That's adhesion. And then again, because of the polarity of the water molecule, it has cohesion attached to the xylem of the, um, of the plant cells. So remember the xylem are made up of those um, tracheid cells, which are basically dead, which means they're basically a big straw of cellulose. And then cellulose are repeating units of glucose. We know glucose is a polar molecule with lots of OHs hanging off it. Another good thing to review before the AP exam. And we know that hydrogen bonds can be made between the water and the cellulose, basically. I like to say that it's holding on to the edges, and then the water molecules are holding on to themselves, and it kind of works its way up the plant. Now, what's the draw for it to go up to the leaf? And you did the lab, um, or you're, you are doing the lab, about looking at the stomata on the underside of the leaf. Remember, the guard cells surround pores called stomata. Those pores open. They allow for gas, gases to ex be exchanged, CO2 to come in and oxygen to leave. But also, they are a way for water to evaporate. As water evaporates there, it literally pulls more water molecules up from the bottom. We'll do a lab on transpiration starting, I believe, Monday or Tuesday, and you'll get to measure the amount of water leaving a plant. So here's a close-up picture of those stomata and some information about how they work. You're going to be taking non-colorized pictures that will be almost as good as this, although this is a scanning electron microscopy picture. You'll just have a light microscope picture. So here's our guard cells. 
So in the light, it says that the guard cells are actively pumping protons out, thus encouraging those um, ions, potassium and chlorine, to come in. The higher potassium and chlorine concentrations give guard cells a more negative water potential, causing them to take up water. They want to go to the negative side, and then they get puffy. Turgor pressure makes them pop open and make a pore. The reverse happens at night. Potassium and chloride diffuse out, water diffuses out. They kind of close up like a sandwich, and the pores close. One more picture of our open stomata. Then lastly, just a very, very brief discussion about how the phloem works. Remember we said that the phloem is made up of the sieve tube elements that have little holes at the edges to allow water to carry the sucrose from the source to the sink. So in this case, in a growing cherry tree, for example, the leaves are making the sugars with photosynthesis. So the veins in the leaves have that sucrose um, building up, it gets transported along with water into the phloem and it gets stored into the fruits, in this case the cherries, to will be the sink. If this was a tree, or maybe a carrot, it would be going all the way down to the roots. It's helped by the xylem which has a constant flow of water going up that and it diffuses into those phloem. But this is actively being um, moved in the other direction. And that's it. I think there's enough time to watch this little video clip here. Let me see if I have to resize my window. Hmm. Maybe if huh? We'll watch it in class too. Let's see. Gonna take time to reload it. Oh, maybe too much time, huh? See the carnivorous plant. It's actually in another language, so I'm gonna shut that sound off. Well, maybe I'll talk over it. So here's our bug. It has to hit two of those hair cells at the same time, and then, ooh, there he goes, he gets caught in it. So it turns out that the, the leaf has two sense cells. If they get touched at the same time, it goes up. There you go.